Welcome. Uh, my name is Anthony Franco. I'm a president and one of the founders of Effective UI. Um, we're going to talk today a little bit about um, user experience strategy and tactics um, and poke a little bit of fun at my mom a little bit later. Um, also, I uh, wanted to share a little bit, of an a little anecdote, you know, why care about user experience? Um, I was uh, sitting with the CIO of a company called Level 3. Anybody here? Here of level three, large engineering company, bunch of bunch of geeks, um, and they, they do all the telco, all the fiber runs that runs on the uh, in the United States. Pretty much is owned by level three, and he was talking to us about injecting a user experience strategy in his organization. And I said, Well, why do you, an engineering company, care about user experience? And he said, He thought about it, and he said, Because I'm a capitalist. And that was the best answer to that question. I loved the obviously self-serving answer to that question, but I loved his positioning of it. I thought, okay, this guy gets it. Um, so this is supposed to be an intensive workshop. It intimidated me a little bit when I heard that. So I'm cramming a lot of content in here. Lots of slides, lots of tactics, examples. I'm going to speak really quick. I'm hoping to leave a little bit of time at the end for Q&A if you have it. Um, so let's, let's go ahead and jump right in. Um, the first thing I want to do is kind of position what user experience is. And this is a marketing conference. I get it. I'm asking you to take your marketing hat off. There's a difference. Somebody once said, there's the difference between the thing and the selling of the thing or the marketing of the thing. When we talk about user experience um, at Effective UI, we're talking about the thing, the product itself. Not the brochure, but the product. Um, so again, at Effective UI, we, we and I'm not going to turn this into a sales pitch, just to give you a, a, a position of what we do, we, we, we build large scale implementations for enterprises, Boeing, FedEx, um, Fidelity, the Office of the Director of National Intelligence, hire us not to, not to design their website, but to design the way their customers engage digitally. It's a little bit of a difference. So we're building things, products. So this, this problem always pops up when we're talking about building the thing. There's a very clear delineation in enterprises and large companies or in small companies on who is responsible for marketing. But who's responsible in an organization for the product, for building the product? Typically, in, the, in a digital world, we have the geeks versus the hipsters, uh, the, the coders, the technologists versus the creative directors. And I'm a geek. I came from software development background. We screw this up. And by the way, creative directors screw this up as well. They, we screw up the creation of digital products. We all suck at this. Uh, everybody here, raise your hand if you have not had a problem with some kind of software at some time in your life. Raise your hand if you have been delighted by software. Very few. I'm the same way. So let's, let's poke fun at the, at the technologist for a second. So I'm, I'm sitting in California with my wife where we have a GPS in our car. We're trying to navigate. Um, to a place, and I get the Garmin device in my rental car, and it pops up, and I'm supposed to enter. I always hate this screen, this screen on a Garmin device. It's an ABC keyboard. I always wind up hitting the back button, and it takes me back a screen. I don't know which, where the space is, and I hate this device. I viscerally hate every time I have to enter an address to get where I want to go. This thing is terrible. And then I'm, I'm, you know, I'm complaining about it and user experience. These guys don't get it. Um, I think I know everything about user experience, and I'm complaining to my wife about it. And then I thought for a second, well, what, is, what does this thing do? So I imagined I was the guy that invented, that, you know, invented the Garmin. The, uh, Dr. Mincal, he's the CEO of Garmin. I put myself in his shoes. Imagine what this guy did. He replaced the way we used to get from here to there in an analog way, write it on a piece of paper. And he did it by connecting to 24 satellites rotating the, rotating the globe. He pinpointed where we are within three meters. 
tied in real-time traffic data, fit it into our pocket, and he did it for a hundred bucks. And you think about the monumental engineering effort this, this took. It's amazing infrastructure. And I'm whining about the UI. And the truth is, is that I, I should know better, right? I'm, a, I'm an industry insider. But I still complain about the system, even when it's not the system, it's the UI. To users, to us, the interface is the system. So I'm making a plea to developers to realize that you've missed something if you don't take it the final way. And I'm going to quote this guy a lot. For you to sleep well at night, aesthetic, the aesthetic, the quality has to be carried all the way through. He was, he, everybody knows Steve Jobs was obsessive about design, not just from the UI standpoint, but also the way the logic board was laid out. And I'm not saying we need to get to that level of obsession, but if we're not carrying it the last mile to the UI, you're missing the whole point of software development. Creative directors, hipsters, designers, you don't get it any easier from me. You guys mess it up too. So I'm going to take this out of the digital realm and talk about uh, the W Hotel. So I stayed at the W Hotel a couple weeks ago, and they really, I don't know if you've ever stayed at a W, beautiful hotels, really well designed. They really get aesthetics. The, the, the sinks, the lamps, the way, when you walk into the hotel, it's beautiful. But use this lamp in the dark. I'm, a, I'm kind of a bright guy, right? I walk into my, I know how to use technology. I walk in, try to turn on the lamp when it's dusk outside. I'm spinning this thing around. I don't get it. I actually looked and saw this little thing called Wish. And for a moment, I thought, maybe I need to wish the light to turn on. For just a moment. <laughs> In reality, I had to spin the lamp completely around, this beautiful piece of engineering around to find a little pull chain to turn the light on. Really well designed, horrible to use. Then you try to find the full length mirror. If you're in the bathroom, you shut the door, there's no full length mirror. But the when you, only time you shut the door is when you're, when you're in the bathroom. Well, if you're out of the bathroom and you shut the door, there's the mirror, you find it. If, you're, if you wanna, Grab a drink, you have to find the hidden compartment with the drinks. If you want to turn on the water, and I always get frustrated with showers in a hotel. They're all different. They all try to use this fancy design, and I always wind up turning the water a little bit the wrong way and burning myself or, or, or having really cold, a really cold shower that I didn't need. So to turn on the hot water, you have to kind of bend around the sink and look and figure out how to turn the sink on. Designers kind of geeked out on the design of this hotel room, and they completely lost the fact that somebody has to use it. Again, quoting uh, Steve Jobs, design is not just what it looks and feels like, it's how it works. And he talks about this intersection of, the, of technology and the liberal arts. How do we do that in a software development environment? And when we talk about user experience and building digital products, we are talking about building software. Even if it's, if it's a website, it's still software. So how do we get the geeks and the hipsters to co-create? We're going to go through some strategies and some tactics. Um, first strategy, empathy over ego. Ego is the number one killer of good user design. Number one killer. So we always, con we constantly push for our team to have empathy for the end user. And I always get Steve Jobs misquoted or miscalculated from a lar large organizations. So the problem with empathy and having empathy for the users, they always say, well, Steve Jobs intuited great design. He was this brilliant designer. He knew what the iPhone should be, and he designed it without talking to users. First of all, that's not entirely true. Steve Jobs did talk to a lot of his users. But secondly, he designed for himself. He had deep empathy for designing the iPhone because he was building something he wanted. We don't have that luxury oftentimes in enterprises. If we're building something for a 16-year-old diabetic patient, none of us are that. If we're building something for a field sales enablement 
portal, a lot of us don't carry bags. So the, we need to gain empathy in other ways because we're not the person we're designing the software for. First thing that, that we do often is we have, we make sure that the enterprise itself, that we have empathy for the stakeholders that are funding the initiative, that care about it. So we run workshops to make sure everybody's on the same page and everybody in the enterprise has similar empathetic feelings for the other constituents in the room and that we have feel it as well. Then we build tech empathy, extremely important to understand the ecosystem that we're in integrating with. And the most important piece is that our designers work with our research team to understand at a deep level what users want out of the system. And this is a very powerful tool, and I'll talk about it later, but user research and having the design team involved in the user research and the development team involved in the user research produces really powerful results later, mostly because they start to feel and have empathy for the end user. There is a caution to this, though. A lot of times, teams take this to the nth level and let their users design the system. That's not, you can't do that. A real simple example is we built an eBay desktop. We built and designed eBay desktop. And during one of the user interviews as we were prototyping this thing, their power users asked us, where's the refresh button? We need a refresh button. This is a desktop app. The data's live. We don't need a refresh button, but we kept hearing it. And at one point, we prototyped putting a refresh button in. And it was like the elevator button. When you get into the elevator and it's a closed button, it really doesn't do anything, but it makes you feel good. That's what the refresh button did. And our lead experience architects said, wait a minute, what are the users actually saying? They're saying, I don't trust the data. So how can we get the users, make this refresh button request go away and get the users to trust data? Well, if you see on the right there, you can barely see it, it's these little countdown timers. They just show you when the auction's ending. So you don't need to press the refresh button because you know the data is live because it's moving. And when we put this in, the refresh button request went away. So don't let your users design the UI. You have to intuit. You have to, that's when you intuit from user research what to put into the, into the design. Sorry, let's jump ahead. Uh, strategy number two, define outcomes, not features. Go into, we go into uh, an organization when they want us to talk about user experience and, what, and they want to completely redesign the, the experience that their customers have with, it, with their organization, and they come to us with a list of features. A real good, ex a good example of that, flashing back to the, the eBay example, you know, a, co a co company would say, we want a refresh button, and what they should be coming to us with is users will trust real-time data. Um, so an, other examples of this may be like sortable columns if you're having a lot, lot of data rows. That's a feature. Uh, um, instead of that, you say rel relatively f um, relevantly formatted data. I want a map. No, you want your users to find your locations. Um, I want a Facebook like button. No, what you want is a, want, you want a way to share, your, your people to share an experience. And I know it's, I, it feels like I'm splitting hairs here. It's really important to do it this way instead of defining features. It takes handcuffs off your design team later. A tactic in order to start defining outcomes and um, and defining things in the right way. One of the ways is we take that research that we did in the early stages and we look for patterns. We map it out. We look for user flows. And we start mapping out patterns and looking for things that they're trying to get done. We start defining things in user terms. Then we build personas. Instead of, instead of talking about John the user, we talk about archetypes. So we look for those patterns and we bucket them into a user behavior archetype. This isn't your traditional marketing persona that talks about demographic data, like where they shop, what magazines they read. It's behavioral personas. Another tactic that we use, and this is a very powerful tool as well, where we map user desires and needs into a customer journey to understand their emotional state of being, where they're basically, where they're getting upset and where they're getting frustrated and where they're finding pleasure from the moment they enter an experience to days after they leave. How does that thing interact with them in, in, in over, the long, over the long term? 
These customer journeys um, and personas help us start to define and, again, build empathy within the team to understand what is the next thing that we're going to be building for this user to solve their pain, not features. The third thing that is often always forgotten is making a business case for this. So I talked about the CIO and he wanted to be a, he wants to be a, you know, he wants UX because he wants, because he's a capitalist. Well, selling that back into the organization is difficult. Some typical things that we hear when we talk about creating an ROI story in an enterprise are from a bottom line perspective, in other words, saving money, increased customer self-service, um, so reduced calls into the support center, more efficient development, fewer features, the right features, no useless applications, reduced maintenance costs, reduced hard goods costs. So what I mean by that is um, we, did a, we just recently did a field sales enablement app, iPad app where we gave iPads to, I think it was 6,000 sales reps and it replaced the printout they had to do every week. And they saved $1.5 million in paper and ink alone by just putting a better user experience on an iPad. So those are some of the bottom line savings that we see. Top line, improved customer satisfaction, decreased, increased engagement, increased cus customer lifetime value, differentiation. Differentiation's an interesting one. Um, your competition will often steer you wrong. Airline sites, I think we've all used them, most of us from out of town, are horrible. And they're all incestually bad. They look at one another and they copy the crappy features their competitors have. They think they have 100 features, if we have 110, we're 10% better. So differentiation is important, but not from a feature by feature basis. Delta actually does it really well. There's a lot of problems with Delta still, but they, they took all of that mess that everybody else had and found out, found out what user their main user group wanted and designed just for them. Took everybody else out. They, I wish I had stats on this for you on how well they're doing. Intuitively, I think this is, they're, they're killing it with this design, but they're not publishing anything. I think it's because they don't want their competitors to know how successful it is, but they're just, I wish I had some stats on here, I don't, but go use the Delta site, it's way better than United or American Airlines. Another tactic that we use is what we call vision demos. So one thing is to look at the ROI, but also you have to internally sell the vision of what you're trying to do. And it's difficult to do in a software initiative that is trying to solve complex business problems. So you have to make sure you go back into the organization. We have to make sure we have to go back into the organization and sell what it is that we're doing. This is a vision demo, and I just lost my connection. This is something we built for Coca-Cola. And it shows an enterprise application that allows collaboration on designs between um, executives and their ad agencies that are doing package design. And it shows how we're going to solve the problem, how we're going to engage collaboration within, um, solve their business problem from a collaboration perspective from agent to um, executive. It also is purposefully emotive. It's, it's basically trying to solve the problem of what they call Santa's nose is too big. So they would design something flat, a Christmas can, right? They designed the, the, the Christmas can flat. And then eventually when it got on a package, that, Christmas, that packaging would wrap around a can and Santa looked like he's been drinking for three days straight. So how do you wrap that design around a 3D object and understand how you're going to collaborate on that 3D object? The vision demo painted what we were trying to solve for, for, from a Coca-Cola perspective and how it would potentially be implemented. And this was used to sell the project internally. Often vision demos are also used to engage customers on what it is that we're going to be building. So it also can be used as a sales tool. All right, that's a vision demo. Strategy four, stop competing with yourself. We talked about differentiation. We have internal silos that really blow each other up in an organization. So I, um, I sh uh, again, uh, uh, an analog example of this, I, I shop at Express Men's for t-shirts and shirts and stuff, like this store. 
engaging store, um, real easy to shop in, um, good products, but you go to their website and just look at their website. Somebody once said, if you want to know how unorganized an organization is, look at their website. And, and all the things that are happening on this website, they're all competing with one another. So we'll take a look at it. So somebody in an organization somewhere said, we need to, have, we need to be social, so let's add some social tags. And we need to prove that we're secure, so we're going to add a, a McAfee um, secure site tag. And we need to gather email addresses. So we're going to add an, sign up for the, the newsletter. We need to create an experience. So let's put a radio on our site. We need to have more conversions. So let's throw 30% off on the website. We're still not getting enough email addresses. Let's throw a pop-up in front of the site as the user on the home page, right when they get there. You know that annoying experience you get when you walk into a store and you got the salesperson that kind of hounds you and you're like, just leave me alone, I'm just looking. They, Express has managed to bring that experience online as well. There's a person standing with a clipboard outside of the store asking you for your email address. That's their home site. 10% of their site is dedicated to what I went there for. 10%, and that's to buy a shirt. That was six months ago. They haven't changed it. They still have that annoying guy at the front of the site. One of the tactics we use is we start to map out user or business centric flows. This is how we want, so this is for a shipping company, and this is how they described what the ideal user flow is for their customers coming in. It, and it's very business centric, so shipping weighed in, billing weighed in, marketing weighed in. Everybody had their own constituent um, weighing in on the user flow of the software. And tying back to user research and presenting user research forward, we said, this is what your, the experience is that your users actually want. So going through this exercise of mapping out what your, what your business is asking for and what your customer is asking for, the, the contrast is pretty stark. Powerful tool to make the right decisions. And a humble plea, stop using social as much as we are. Use it very limited. We don't need a like button on everything. And, we, and, and, I, and, I, and I say that very respectfully. Social is a very powerful tool from a market, for a marketing perspective and sometimes from a UX perspective, but we see it added on to way too much. And it's because some CEO's kid is saying, Dad, you need a Facebook page. And that's a real story. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not even exaggerating. We've had that conversation before. Strategy five, do it right the very first time. So Express didn't do it right the very first time, and they lost me as a customer. They literally lost me as a customer. You look at Garmin, um, so customer loyalty is a reason to do it right the first time. Another reason is actually something that you don't, you go into this what I call user experience debt. Garmin is now in that spot where if they change the UI, they now have to make a decision if they improve their UI, make it easier to use. They have to make a decision. Do I focus on new customers that are adopting Garmin and alienate everybody that knows how to use this now? They now have a UI that they're stuck with because they, if they change it, their current users are lost. They don't know how to use it. They have to relearn the system. And I've been a part of a lot of, com a lot of company organization conversations where they're having this exact argument. Well, we did it wrong a year ago, and we, have, we can't alienate those customers anymore that are doing it the wrong way. So now they have this dual effort going on, and it's extraordinarily expensive to fix things that you've, that you've broken. There is a problem, though. I get that. I mean, business has mon they have money, a limited amount of money. So how do you get this? And this is the innovation S-curve. How do you get, this looks like the innovation S-curve. So what, what we're talking about, how do you get to that sweet spot of the right, the right amount of rightness and the right amount of time and money that you spend in, in, a, in a project? And this is very complicated. 
a lot of constituent building, a lot of politics that you have to play, a couple of things that we do to help get an organization wrapping their head around what this needs to look like. First, we ask them, where in the market do you want to be? So pick a spot. Do you want to build a minimally viable product when you d deliver it? Do you want to achieve market parity? Do you want to match what your competitors are doing at the very least? Do you want to differentiate? Do you want to disrupt? And all of these are perfectly okay answers, but get your company to pick a spot on this on the scale of where they want this product to be. It helps to define the budget, at least. Another thing um, is everybody in, in, in the user, user experience has been a buzzword for the last two years. And everybody has a user experience expert <laughs> on their resume. HFI folks and designers and project managers are all now talking about user experience. It's, it's, um, it's you don't want important company initiatives to be their first or second UI that they're building. Hiring experts is critical, or hiring internal experts or an outside agency is critical. Somebody that's done two, three, four hundred projects has seen the things that they shouldn't be doing. Very important. And embracing change, I'm going to let this play. All right, totally over the top. I get it. Um, and I, I, I know this is almost like you almost have mental masking tape when you hear somebody say embrace change. You're like, yeah, we hear that all the time. How do we get an organization to embrace change? Well, first of all, you can point at the track record and say, if you, you know, we're always doing what we've always done. We always get, we're going to continue to always get what we've always got. What, again, what a very, a, a very powerful tool that we use when we're trying to get an organization to change how they're doing things is we point back to user research. I know this is what you want us to do, but our customers are asking us to do that. You take it out of that argument of I think, and you're putting it into argument of our customers want. Very powerful tool to, to get an organization to change. And you have to go back, going back to that first strategy. You have to have empathy to be able to have that conversation. And you have to start injecting empathy into the organization. Six, um, and I know I said who should own at the very beginning, the geeks or the hipsters. Um, and this is, a, this is controversial in the user experience world. I realize that I'm going to get a lot of guff for putting this out there publicly. But the geeks own the delivery. So I know we have a bunch of marketers here. Uh, and I, I didn't even survey the audience. How many people here are in marketing? H how many geeks are here? A couple. OK, so a oh, good mix. Wow, that's great. So you guys, I'm telling you, you own it. You own the delivery. Designers, marketers, we haven't built the software product. We don't know what it's like. We, haven't, we don't know what a system API looks like. We don't know how to architect a data structure or APIs. So you have to rely on your software developers to build it. Thomas Edison said, vision without execution is hallucination. Great, great articulation of this. So design without code doesn't work. Our CTO puts it a little bit better. In this, in this realm, an experience is not realized until it is in working software. So IT. Coders, I don't care if they're in IT or wherever, but the technologists have to own the delivery of it. The problem is, is that we don't know how to design. We have no clue how to design. You might find that rare guy that understands it, but we know how to build, and we like to solve puzzles. We don't know how to design. So the way we solve this 
in, a, in, a, in a, a UX project, a project that cares about user experience and user adoption, is we inject research and design in the development process. So making sure that we're looping in user feedback and, and design feedback in the development loop. The other problem that we have and that we're trying to solve for is that us as designers don't know how to deliver working software. We design these beautiful things that actually looks like an Escher painting. They can't be built. Stuff's not there for it. So one of the tactics we use in design um, is, so there's this point at which we've designed enough and we've researched enough that we can actually get started with development, and there's a fine line there. But the, the, the initial design and research phase of a project is get to, get to a point at which you have a clear direction and you've designed enough. But once you start designing into what we call a UI spec, you've gone too far. And a UI spec is every single user interaction written down on paper. That's more what, what we call in development terms a waterfall approach. And every development team I've ever talked to, that when we talk about a waterfall approach where we try to design everything up front, ev to figure out everything up front, and then we start coding, which coders seem to love, but it never works out because you ask them, in that process, when we waterfall it down, how many times does the end product actually look like the UI spec? It never works out that way. We always wind up iterating anyway. So stop, stop going to this level of detail in the design process, because it doesn't work. Software projects are predictably unpredictable. So when we talk about how we design, we treat everything from the design department as a prototype. There aren't designs, they're prototypes. The sketches, the visual comps in software development, the visual comps, the, the wireframes, the sketches, they're all prototypes. And the product, the end product, is defined only when the end product is done. That makes procurement people go nuts, by the way. Nobody likes to procure services like this. We don't know what we're going to have. We don't know what it's going to look like. But we can roughly say it's going to wind up here, and it's going to cost roughly this much. Another humble plea from design, focus on simplicity, especially in the early stages. The development needs to do this as well. So this extreme passion for simplicity. Here's an example of, of doing it wrong. So I walked up to an ATM, put my card in. The ATM stops me and says, what language do you speak? And they should know that, right? You, Bank of America should know that I'm an English-speaking person. So they, they sh they're making me go through this extra step I don't need to. And they had to build this extra step. They had, this had to go through legal review and development cycles on wh whether or not this could be done, design iterations. But this wasn't enough. They had to confirm in English that I'm speaking English. Like, why? Why did they make me go through this extra step? This is redundant. It's ridiculous. This is an extreme passion for making things as complex as I possibly can. Again, to overquote, to overuse Apple as an example, they focus amazingly on simplicity so much for, so that they've taken things away that were redundant. Apple took out the OK and cancel buttons. You make the change, it's done. You don't have to confirm it. Amazon does a great job of this. You put something in a shopping cart, it's in your shopping cart. You don't, they don't ask you, do you really want to buy this? They just make the undo process easy. They just don't make you iterate through the confirmation process. The last strategic point, and I'm running way ahead of time, um, future proof, proof flan, plan for the novice, sorry. Um, so what I mean, for, mean by this is we're, we're getting to a point where the experts don't matter anymore. The, the internet technology used to be for late adopters. We used to matter. We don't anymore. You look at this, like this, this innovation S-curve. Um, and I think the guy's name is Tard, Gabriel Tard. Is that how you pronounce that? Am I pronouncing that right? A poor kid in high school. Um, so he, he drew this innovation S-curve. 
and he said, and, and basically said there's early adopters, everybody's heard this, early adopters, middle, middle adopters, late adopters. Globally speaking, 30, only 32% of people are on the internet. There's still 100, oh, there's 80 million people in North America that are not on the internet yet. There's still a lot of people that aren't on the internet yet. And that's changing based on this device. This device is changing the game. They've had more people adopt the iPad in the last year than have adopted Macs in the last 22. 60 million iPads in their first year. 60 million Macs. That's all of the Macs. MacBook, Mac Pro, iMac. 60 million in the last 22. And the reason is what I call these early, late adopters. This is my mom. Um, and I got her an iPad about a year ago. She's never used a computer before. She's never touched the internet. Didn't know what a Facebook was. Didn't know what email was. Handed her an iPad. She's all over it. She is the, the person that we now have to start accounting for when designing for these, what I call early late adopters. One of the problems designing for these folks, and it's a whole new paradigm that we have to think about, is compl um, complexity, she's lost. She's lost on Facebook. She uses it, but she's still lost. Explain to her what the difference between an email, a chat, a message, writing a wall post, and all of these options I can do on the Facebook iPad app, she's lost. Complexity does not suit her. Again, focusing on that simplicity, extremely important. The second thing, which is counterintuitive to how we approach mobile design, is new features suck for her. So in mobile design, we always think about we need to get the next version out, the next dot iteration, more features to engage our users. It's not a good thing for the late adopters. Because every new feature is, I have to relearn the app all over again. So we often find getting it right the first time and kind of leaving it alone and just watching them and iterating based on their feedback after they use it for a while is the best way to design for these novice users. We also have a problem as an industry in what I call in empathy blindness. So this is a very simple thing for all of us. We've been using computers for years. A submit button, we know what it does. But what does this mean to my mom? What does this mean to the late adopters? For her, it literally means I'm going to break my iPad. I could do something that is going to break my iPad. I don't want to touch that. I, I know we have all have these you know, late adopters that we're working with that they're, like, they're afraid to touch it. So empathy blindness, we have it. So we have a very difficult time with these late adopters because we have metaphors. We've formed connections in our brain that they haven't formed. And things that are obvious to us, Things that we used to design for, because it was obvious, it's the way things have always been done, completely out of left field for them. So the tactic is to kind of double down. Going through research, prototype, test, repeat. It's really the only way we've been able to effectively design for these late adopters. Ultimately, if you look at some of the people that are doing it successfully, Come up. This is the Social Security Administration website. Mom did this on her own. She applied for Social Security on her own. And they did, it, they did an amazing job looking at simplicity, simple calls to action, taking as much out of the site as they possibly could, simple user, simple flow, a breadcrumb trail, an idea of how long this thing is going to take. And they did it as plainly and unsexified as they possibly could. She did this on her own. Big, big kudos to Social Security. And they're getting a lot of awards for this site. They did a really good job for the late adopters. So I thought I'd uh, share one last story with you. Um, early, the early adopter meets bad design, or my mom meets the lamp. Brought my mom to New York with us uh, a couple weeks ago, first time in New York. And I said, Mom, use a lamp. And she said, you mean the coffee maker? I said, no, that's a lamp. So she tried to 
turn it on there. She turned it around. Frustration setting in. Is it under here? And I'm laughing at her, but I did this exact same thing. Maybe further down. Really frustrated now. I told her to look in the back. And she's pissed. She finally found it. So my plea is to let's stop frustrating my mom. I don't like the technical support calls, neither do you. Have some empathy for the people that are using the things that we're building. 